Good evening and welcome to the 13th session of the virtual Bible study and this evening I like to begin from the book of Daniel chapter 7 verses 1 to 8 so as usual let me take the study for some 30 minutes and then towards the end of the session I will leave it open for you to interact and reflect and ask questions so let me begin with the word of prayer now and after which we will sing take me past the outer courts let us look to God in prayer Father, we thank and praise you for this evening and we praise you for bringing us together. Teach us, Lord, the sanctity and the depth of your word so that we may understand how that we may relate your word in this life through us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray that you keep us away from all forms of distraction and help us to focus and concentrate on what you want us to know this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Join along with me as we worship God together by singing this uh, song entitled Take Me Past the Outer Courts and Through the Holy Place. Once again and it's great to have you for the virtual Bible study it's a new month and I know that God will continue to give us new reflections and a new providence this evening we will study from Daniel chapter 7 and verses 1 to 8 and the subject that we will focus is the four great beasts of the world and this is part one in the series last week we studied about Daniel in the lion's den and how God protected him and also about the struggles of life and other deeper truths from the scripture in essence. Now today we will look at chapter 7 of Daniel and in this study we will get to see an outline of ancient history given before it happened. Let me read to you now from Daniel chapter 7 and verses 1 to 8 and I request you to follow your Bibles or do pay attention on the slide projected on the screen Daniel chapter 7 verse 1 in the first year of Belshazzar king of Babylon Daniel had a dream and visions passed through his mind as he was lying on his bed he wrote down the substance of his dream Daniel said in my vision at night I looked and there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea 
four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. The first was like a lion, and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off, and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a man, and the heart of a man was given to it. And there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, Get up and eat your fill of flesh. After that I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard. And on its back it had four wings like those of a bird. This beast had four heads, and it was given authority to rule. Verse 7. After that, in my vision at night I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth, it crushed and devoured its victims, and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. Verse 8. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them, and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth that spoke boastfully. I suggest we take down notes and uh, questions so that uh, we could proceed with them once we are through the study tonight. Now, chronologically, this chapter takes place before chapter 5. And at this time, King Belshazzar had just been given a position of authority in 553 BC. And Daniel was probably in his later 60s in age out here. The first six chapters of Daniel present history and the last six chapters are visions relating mainly to the future. This first year stated in verse 1 represents a flashback to 533 BC, 14 years before the feast that took place in Daniel chapter 5. Now chapter 7 and chapter 8 occur after chapter 4 but before chapter 5. Now the reason for this kind of an arrangement is for us to get a systematic sequence for the future events. Now the dream of Daniel in Ch uh, Daniel chapter 7 moves far beyond Daniel's day to the coming of Israel's king to end all Gentile kingdoms and to establish God's eternal kingdom. Please bear this in mind that the first six chapters of Daniel are a historic chronology but chapter 7 through chapter 12 are visions that took place during the period historically described in chapter 1 through 6. Now Daniel's four dreams took place over a period of 22 years. In Daniel chapter 1 through chapter 6 Daniel interpreted dreams for others but in chapter 7 is a dream given to Daniel and it is interpreted by an angel. And we also see in chapter 7 God's viewpoint of that same time. A bunch of insatiable beasts devouring one another. Now in chapter 7 Daniel had a vision of four great beasts each representing a world empire. This was similar to Nebuchadnezzar's dream in chapter 2. Nebuchadnezzar's dream covered the political aspects of the empires but in Daniel's dream here in chapter 7 depicts the moral characteristics of those empires. Daniel had many visions. He had many dreams that he did not understand in its entirety which signifies his limitedness and humanness uh, though he was very very wise. Now the visions of Daniel helps us to see that we should interpret all of history in light of God's eternal kingdom because Daniel's visions reveal that the Messiah will be the ruler of a spiritual kingdom that will overpower and overshadow all other earthly kingdoms. So this should come as a great encouragement to us today to know that all these earthly kingdoms and governments 
whether it is democracy, communistic, socialistic, anarchy or dictatorial government, they will all be vanished and dismantled no matter how hard they try. The writing of God's finger concerning them is already written on the wall. They will have no recovery. Now the liberals and the skeptics of the Bible find it hard to accept the prophetic portions of Daniel. The question is why? Because these chapters are so accurate that these chapters seem to have been written after the events have taken place. But one should understand that when he or she reads biblical prophecies, prophecy is not a problem for God because God stands above history. By that I mean he knows the history from the end to the beginning. Now these nations which uh, Daniel sees in his dream, which would reign over Israel, were evil and cruel. But Daniel also saw God's everlasting and indestructible kingdom arriving and conquering them all. Now Daniel in his dream sees a, sees a great sea. Four seas are generally mentioned in the Bible. The Galilean Sea, the Red Sea, the Dead Sea and the Great Sea. The Galilean Sea, the Red Sea, the Dead Sea and the Great Sea. The Great Sea in the Bible is today the modern Mediterranean Sea. In his dream, Daniel was standing by the Great Mediterranean Sea. By that, but there is also a figurative meaning to the word sea. That is the Great Sea of Humanity or in a generic sense, sea is referring to people. The second thing that Daniel saw in his dream was four winds blowing on that sea. Wind coming from all four directions as we read in verse 2 would create as we know of today a tornado or a cyclone or something very similar to that. The number four in the Bible often stands for the earth. Now this means that it had to do with the entire human race. We have the four winds from the four corners of the world, the four points of the compass and the four seasons. In this passage, Daniel is picturing a gigantic sea with winds from all of the four points of the compass blowing in upon that sea. It is a picture of the world's condition. The striving of the wind upon the sea denotes political strife and uprisings wars and bloodshed among the nations. The third thing Daniel saw was the four great beasts coming out of the sea. Now in the ancient world, generally speaking, animals were used as symbols of kingdoms even as they are used today. Today the lion represents Great Britain, the eagle represents the United States, the tiger represents India. Almost every nation has its own uh, national animal or an own animal representative. Now these beasts in Daniel chapter 7 coming up out of the sea were kingdoms that have existed in the world. Now the words of a sequence in verse 4 through verse 8 are very important to observe. Now the beasts did not all come up at the same time. They followed each other one at a time. Each of these beasts represents a chronology of kingdoms exactly as in Daniel chapter 2. The first, the head of gold was Babylon. The second, the arms and the chest of silver was Medo-Persia. The third, the belly of bronze was Greece. And the fourth, the legs of iron was Rome. The interpretation of chapter 7 will be of the same nations in the same sequence, but the difference is that we will see it from God's viewpoint here. As God looks at them, they are cruel, they are nothing but animals. In verse 4, we read about the first beast. And it says that the first beast was like a lion that had eagle wings. Now what does this mean? You see, the lion is the king of the beasts and the eagle is the king of the birds. The lion with the eagle's wings represent Babylon with a swift conquests. So this animal symbolizes the Babylonian empire which we read in Daniel chapter 2 was symbolized by the head of gold. So how do you connect this? 
Babylon, the head of gold, has now become a lion in God's eyes. That's how we connect it. Babylon, the head of gold in chapter 2, has now become a lion in God's eyes in chapter 7. The national symbol of Babylon was a winged lion. Now, statues of winged lions have been recovered from Babylonian's uh, ruins, and the wings indicate the swift conquest of a strong and a cruel kingdom. This first beast combines the majesty of the lion and the strength and power of an eagle. The first beast that we read in chapter 7 combines the majesty of the lion and the strength and power of an eagle. Now, if you read Jeremiah chapter 49 verses 19 to 22, you will read there the eagle and the lion are both used to describe Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel is very specific when he gives prophecies. When you read Daniel chapter 7 and verse 4, it says of the winged lion, I watched till its wings were plucked off and it was up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man and a man's heart was given to it. When Nebuchadnezzar was proud of his Babylonian empire, God struck him down and he became a beast. He walked on all his four legs and he ate grass. That's the kind of what we see as being a kind of like of being plucked off of one's wings. And in a generic sense, the Babylonians had settled down and become a more a civilized nation. This could be also the meaning of the wings being plucked off. Like Nebuchadnezzar at his return to sanity, the beast got up on two feet. The beast was even given a heart like a man. Stood on two feet as a man represents the humanitarian character of Nebuchadnezzar in his later years post those uh, seven years of judgment. And by and large, the Babylonians also became more like men when their ferocity was gone. Some of the kings recognized God for his mighty exploits. I would believe the heart of the Babylonians would be possible to reach after having seen Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and also Daniel's own protection from the fiery furnace and lions uh, respectively could have helped change the Babylonian heart to the heart of a man. So this beast out of the sea is the Babylonian Empire, which is modern day Iraq. In verse 5, we read about the second beast. And it says that the second animal is a bear. Babylon, the lion, fell to Medo-Persia. In keeping with the sequence in Daniel chapter 2, the next kingdom is Medo-Persia. There are 13 references to bears in the Bible. Every time they are mentioned, they are cast in a context of ferociousness, violent behavior. These bears have appetites that are never satisfied. This second kingdom has never satisfied until she reached from the Indus River on the east to the land of Egypt and the again sea on the west. God granted the second kingdom the authority to subjugate many nations like a greedy bear. In the dream, there were three ribs in the mouth of the bear. The three ribs in its mouth represents the conquests of three major enemies that uh, Medo-Persia had. Historians tell us that Medo-Persia conquered Lydia, Babylon and Egypt. We don't hear of this nation anymore called Lydia because it was an Iron Age kingdom of Western Asia existing between 1200 to 546 BC. Well, the ribs in the mouth of the bear were these victims of the hunt, Lydia, Babylon and Egypt. Still, the bear was not satisfied. Daniel also saw that the bear was lifted or raised up on one side. We can picture this like a circus bear doing a trick with two paws on one side held up. What was the meaning of this in verse 5 that the bear was raised up on one of its sides? It means that in the Medo-Persian Empire, the Persians were dominant. By the end of the book of Daniel, the Medes were about gone. The Persians were in control. 
Persia then is modern Iraq today. All right, as we go ahead to verse 6, we read about the third beast. And it says the third beast looked like a leopard which had on its back four wings of a bird. And this beast also had four heads and uh, dominion was given to it. Now the leopard represented Greece. It is known in the animal kingdom as being the most swiftest, cunning, cruel, with an insatiable appetite for blood. This is in keeping with Daniel chapter 2 and it could be none other than the Greek Empire and under Alexander the Great. History records that Persia was defeated by Greece. The bear was defeated by the leopard. The four wings on the back of the leopard speak of the conquest and of its ability to strike fast. This leopard also had four heads. History tells us that after Alexander the Great died in 323 BC, his kingdom was divided, divided among his four generals, namely Ptolemy, Seleucus, Lysimachus and Cassander. This fits the picture of the four-headed leopard. The leopard's four heads are the four divisions of the Greek Empire after Alexander's death. Now the scripture goes on to say dominion was given to him. Alexander the Great with 35,000 soldiers, he went up against the middle Persian army of around 2 lakh to 3 lakh soldiers and he miraculously won. Everybody said it was the military strategy of Alexander the Great. But it was God who gave the dominion to him as we read in verse 6 as much as Nebuchadnezzar was given dominion over Israel to capture it, uh, over Jerusalem to capture it, Judah to capture it and take it to Babylon. Alexander the Great is considered to be one of the greatest military strategists of all time. The son of Philip, he was, uh, who was the king of Macedonia, Alexander was educated by none other than the famous philosopher Aristotle. He became king at the age of 20 when his father was assassinated and immediately set out to subdue rebellious neighboring states. He attacked Persia at the tender age of 22. He conquered Asia Minor, Syria, Palestine and Egypt. He founded many cities in the ancient world, naming several of them as Alexandria after his own name. Arriving in Babylon at the age of 34, he contracted a fever and he died. Now the spread of Greek culture and the Greek language in which the New Testament was written is a result of the dominance of Alexander the Great's empire, Greece, for many years. But still Alexander was subject to a higher power. And God showed that he alone is sovereign by fulfilling his word through the prophecy of Daniel of paving the way for the fourth beastly empire. Now as we keep reading on verse 7 tells us about the fourth beast and it says the fourth beast looked terrifying and frightening and very powerful and different from the other beasts. Chapter 2 of Daniel says about Rome. The fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron in as much as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything and like iron that crashes that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. In the chapter 4 of Daniel the beast is described as dreadful and terrible exceedingly strong it had huge iron teeth it was devouring breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it and it had ten horns. All this is in verse 7. Now as you can see through what you read of this fourth beast, you will recognize very soon that there is no animal in the animal kingdom to which we can compare the fourth beast. There wasn't anything Daniel could describe when he saw this horrible beast representing the imperialistic and cruel materialism of Rome imperialistic Rome was known for her cruelty. It was Rome that invented crucifixion. It was Rome that crucified Peter. It was Rome that beheaded Paul. 
it was rome that banished john the apostle it was rome that burned the christians and also crucified jesus christ truly it was different from all the beasts that were before it in its cruelty now the 10 horns that we read here are the 10 kingdoms who rule simultaneously among them one will appear who conquering the others will eventually dominate the entire empire and become the world dictator we'll study about that more next week we are talking here about the antichrist so far there has never been a 10 part roman empire so this has to be much more in the future most prophetic scholars believe this part of the prophecy will be fulfilled in some kind of a revived roman empire perhaps even something like the european common market when we call this 10 part empire we are not exactly accurate because these 10 horns grow out of the head of the fourth beast they are a last development of the fourth beast this suggests that rome was not destroyed nor did it disappear rome is the only kingdom that did not get conquered by a greater power rome did not die she fell apart because of internal corruption and rottenness please note that the nations of western europe and those adjacent to the mediterranean sea are still geographically a part of what was once the roman empire nations that immigrated to rome did not establish a new kingdom but intermarried into the roman families and continued the old roman kingdom without dominion the 10 horns are 10 kings and the little horn that we read in verse 8 is another king who will rise after the 10 and be coexistent with them the 10 kingdoms represented by the 10 horns may be the nations that will grow out of the old roman empire or they may be 10 future kings who will rule over some form of a revived roman empire now the roman empire has been reconstructed in our day today with a common market nations i believe the 10 horns could be the nations which make up the common market the horn speaks of power this is a powerful organization headquartered in rome or somewhere out there in the revived roman empire now in verse 8 the scripture talks about another horn a little one which came up among the 10 kingdoms and it had eyes like a man and mouth that spoke boastfully now in verse 8 we also read that three of the first horns were uprooted before this little horn now this means that among the 10 horns three will be replaced by this one horn that is the antichrist who is visible for his dominance you see the membership in this common market nations or what we call generally today as european union is changing daily verse eight speaks of a spokesman who speaks for the entire group and his eyes symbolically speak of intelligence and this wisdom is of a man his mouth is speaking great things indicating that he is in control and speaks for the whole group well the identification of the 10 horns and little horn has generated much discussion but without doubt the little horn represents the antichrist the parallels between this fourth beast and uh, the beast that we read in revelation chapter 13 are unavoidable the description of the beast that is the antichrist in that passage gives a full view of the work of the antichrist in the tribulation period and uh, states that he will emerge from the remnants or the revival of the roman empire i suggest you please read revelation chapter 13 verse 5 and 6 sometime during uh, this evening now these 10 kings had still not come to power at the time of john's vision recorded in the book of revelation the little horn is a future human ruler or the antichrist antichrist or antichrist can be a man or a system operated by mankind well god is illustrating the final end of all worldly kingdoms out here in contrast 
to his eternal kingdom and that is definitely good news now the big question however is how does this progress of human history from babylon to rome relate to me today how does it relate to the church today i think god is trying to teach us something in this passage first of all it is about the progress of human history the progress of human history and its relevance to us today evolution in human history is not observable evolution in human history is not observable modern technological progress in no way invalidates this because it is international justice peace and human government that show national identity and security now these realms are hard to find as we study history in progress although man glories in the advances and achievements of civilization through the centuries god clearly sees human history as a chronicle of immorality brutality and depravity government and its leaders may mask their true character from people for a time but they are always unmasked before god just as we have moved from the royal lion to the beast as human history unfolds it does not get better it will get worse the second thing that i believe that god wants us to learn from this passage is the preservation of human history all of the secular prophets are prophesying that we won't last as a civilization much past the year 2000 and uh, god says that won't happen while the civilization of the 10 kingdoms is still intact jesus will come back let me repeat that again while the civilization of the 10 kingdoms is still intact jesus will come back so the world will remain when jesus christ comes back the third lesson we learn from this passage is the purpose of human history why would god allow the kingdoms to get worse and worse destroying and devouring each other i think it is because god is giving humanity an opportunity to demonstrate how incompetent they are at trying to rule the world which god created all of the revolutions all of the rebelliousness the plots and all of the chaos is just a reminder that what man has never been able to do god in heaven has in control and one day jesus the king is going to come and set it right a great historian by the name of alfred weber wrote some years back in his book farewell to european history these words please listen to the one gifted with historical perspective it must be clear that we are in the end of world history as we know it so let me wind up with this thought no matter how one reads history or ponders the prophecies we all recognize that strange things are happening in the world today conflict and apprehension is almost everywhere in our world concerning political social geographical and economic fronts it feels like war could break out at any time in four or six key spots around the world right now self destruction does not seem unlikely either and it's not wise to write it off so if you are asking this evening what will be the final outcome of the nations in the spirit of history what will be the final outcome of the nations in this spirit of history well that's a good question to ask and ponder and what is the answer to this with all humility may i say that we cannot know all the details but god has provided for us a broad scope of biblical prophecy in the book of daniel which we are studying from here on and we will come to certain concrete conclusions in our further studies from the book of daniel so daniel's vision of the four beasts provided a prophetic look at future world events looking back from our perspective today we know and we see that these events as world history and can easily see the correlation between each beast and a world empire however there was more to daniel's vision and some of it is yet preserved for the future even for us 
Okay, that's been one exhaustive study and I know you've made your notes and have your questions which I would love to respond and also have you reflect on the study tonight. So yes, here you go, please.